Now, the Commonwealth is one of the Queen's most abiding passions, and she's not missed a summit since 1971. But when the Commonwealth heads of government meet in Sri Lanka in November, she will not be there. The royal family will be represented by her heir, the Prince of Wales. So is she, at 87, just getting too old to make such long trips? Or is the controversial setting for this summit a factor in the decision? Our chief correspondent, Alex Thompson, has this. Since the early 70s, the Queen's been a fixture at the biannual Commonwealth conferences. But Sri Lanka presents a huge political test for a supposedly apolitical figure. The issue, the accusation from many that the Sri Lankan government slaughtered tens of thousands of its own people in the final days of the civil war. UN figures say 40,000 at least. While the conflict's ended, we're seeing all sorts of human rights violations now uh, being perpetrated by the government officials. Uh, we're seeing torture, disappearances, um, deaths in custody. And the clampdown on political opposition continues today. Only on Friday, Asaf Sali, the leader of a Muslim Tamil political movement, was arrested and is now in hospital on hunger strike. He'd once shaken hands with the president, but more latterly has been critical of the government. The government's response is to use the Prevention of Terrorism Act to, uh, to arrest and, and shut up people like Azad Sali. But he's, not a, he's by no means the only person. There are, there are, there are uh, members of farmers' unions, there are politicians, the Chief Justice was impeached, lawyers protested, the prot protesters, the lawyers were uh, targeted for protesting against the impeachment of justice. The Queen herself has shaken hands with the Sri Lankan president, much to the anger of Tamils who protested at the time. So for Buckingham Palace, the health reason for pulling out has an undoubted political gain and has been much hinted at in recent weeks by the Foreign Office. Now it seems the palace has delivered. Buckingham Palace insists this has nothing to do with potential political embarrassment, everything to do with the Queen's state of health managing a long-haul flight. So we asked what other long-haul flights are under reconsideration apart from the Sri Lankan one and the palace told us not one. However, Prince Charles will be going, no health concerns there, and conveniently somewhat less of a figurehead than the monarch, of course. It all leaves the suspicion hanging heavily that a royal strategic sickie has been pulled here. The Canadians have been rather more direct, boycotting the conference and saying shaking hands with the Sri Lankan government would be morally repugnant. Their foreign minister pointedly greeting Tamil protesters in London recently. However, David Cameron will be going to the conference alongside Prince Charles in November. I think it's entirely understandable that she's not going to be travelling to Sri Lanka because she is scaling down some of her international um, travelling, which I think is not uh, in the least bit surprising. She's also going to be sending the Prince of Wales in her stead to go to this conference. I'll be going to this conference uh, as well. And so they will be, barring another rethink from either number 10 or the palace. Well, I'm joined now from Glasgow by the Shadow Foreign Secretary, Douglas Alexander. Does the Queen not going there downgrade the summit a little? I think that's entirely a judgment for uh, Buckingham Palace, but the decision that's been reached by Buckingham Palace about the Queen's attendance in no way diminishes the responsibility on the British Prime Minister and the British government to set out its position, apart from the few words that you carried on your report from the Prime Minister. There's been an almost deafening silence about what is the real position of the British government in contrast, as you say, for example, to the Canadian government. So I hope that the focus that the decision Buckingham Palace has reached today will throw on this summit will afford an opportunity for David Cameron to think again and to be clear as to his responsibilities, to set out very clearly to the Sri Lankans their responsibilities given the very serious and continuing allegations in relation to human rights. So, so you think he's wrong to say at this stage he's going? Yes, I do. I think he should be using the coming months between now and November to be very clear to the Sri Lankans that unless we see substantive change, then he, along with the Canadian and other governments, I hope, will give very serious consideration to boycotting this summit. And similarly with Prince Charles? I mean, pre presumably you think it's wrong to say Prince Charles will be going at this stage as well? 
Well, Prince Charles has... Because that's a political the case decision, the isn't it? I mean, Ted Heath advised the Queen not to go to Singapore in 1971. It's a political decision, not a royal well, that's protocol why I was, one. The point I was just coming on to, I really do not think this should be a judgment exercised independently by the royal family. They should reasonably be able to rely on the advice of ministers, of the Foreign Secretary and of the Prime Minister in particular. And that's why I find it so curious and so disappointing that David Cameron seems to have committed himself to attending this summit with six months to go when he should be directly pressurising the Sri Lankan government to take the steps that the United Nations have requested in relation to these very serious allegations of human rights abuses. But the, the point Downing Street would make, I suppose, is that you've got to engage with people in order to change them. Uh, and that you can't change Sri Lanka without going there and talking to them. But what leverage does David Cameron have with six months to go when he's already committed to go to this summit as against the alternative scenario whereby he could say, listen, we want to see an implementation of the kind of steps that the United Nations have been demanding for the last three or four years. It seems to me there is a window of opportunity for the international community and the British government in particular to speak clearly and with one voice about the steps that the Sri Lankan government need to take in relation to not just past allegations of human rights abuses, but very serious continuing allegations of human rights abuses, according not just to Amnesty International last week, but Human Rights Watch and indeed the United Nations. But given Sri Lanka gave pretty short shrift to everybody who demanded they change their position on human rights investigations, including you know, the, the Labour Foreign Secretary David Miliband, who, who went to Sri Lanka and demanded change, I mean, why, why would yep. they care now about not going to well, a summit? They clearly have a great deal of interest in securing as prestigious event as a Commonwealth Heads of Government Summit. And in that sense, the question has to be asked this evening, why should the Sri Lankan government be rewarded with the prestige and the status of a Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting when there are still extremely serious allegations hanging over them? It seems to me, as I say, quite inexplicable why the British government isn't using the leverage available to it between now and November to put the maximum degree of pressure on Sri Lanka to do the right thing to respond to what the United Nations Committee Against Torture and the United Nations more generally have been urging that they act upon now for several months. Douglas Alexander, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Still to come after Margaret Thatcher's favourite Chancellor Nigel Lawson says he's changed his mind about Europe. At 7.35 we hear from a Tory backbencher who not only agrees with him but warns MPs demanding an EU referendum could defect to UKIP.